Hi, so hi everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Australian Fluid Mechanics Seminar. Uh, this is the first one of 2022, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Richard Stevens, who is an Associate Professor in the Physics of Fluids Group at the University of Toronto. Uh, his research interests include computational fluid dynamics, turbulent Rayleigh-Bernard convection, and wind farm fluid mechanics, and he's going to be talking about uh, that last topic uh, a bit today. And so I think, please take it away, Richard. Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, introduction. So it's uh, my pleasure to be uh, giving the first uh, seminar in the series for 2022 and uh, very excited to share some of our research uh, here today. So like for me, like it's very early morning, like for you, like all uh, afternoon. Um, like I think like it's always important to uh, to recognize that it is not just like the work of uh, of one person. So like here, like I'm uh, I'm fortunate to present like the uh, the work with like uh, many different colleagues. Uh, so like here, like a picture of like several of the of the people, and like I indicated the people in bold that contributed most uh, to the work that I will uh, be presenting uh, here today. Uh, and their names are like always uh, listed at the bottom of the slide for the. Uh, uh, various papers that are like relevant to to that part of the of the talk and like i also like learned a lot in the particular from like charles manavo in the niche game when i was uh, at Johns hopkins university uh, and apart from that from many other uh, colleagues in the field either with direct collaborations or uh, very interesting discussions uh, over the years so i have like a few slides on the uh, on the relevance and like developments in the in wind energy to sort of uh, give you like some impression of uh, uh, the things uh, that are going on in the field. So what we see over here is the developments uh, of wind turbines over the last uh, decades, both uh, the height of the turbines as uh, well as the diameter of these turbines is indicated. And what you see over here in this graph is that wind turbines are getting bigger and bigger, uh, both in turbine height and also their turbine diameter gets uh, gets bigger. And the reason for that is that like larger uh, wind turbines are like able to generate more power, and like winds higher up in the atmosphere uh, are also stronger, uh, allowing you to produce more and more wind energy. But it, this will also give some new uh, fundamental challenges that we will uh, see later on in the talk because like atmospheric dynamics higher up in the atmosphere are different, and this is like something that needs to be further explored. And to give you some perspective of scale. Uh, these bigger turbines that are like used nowadays, uh, one blade is like the same length uh, as like the span width of like a A380 jumbo jet. So these uh, wind turbines are like truly massive. Uh, also, like on the background picture, you see it compared to like various uh, iconic buildings. So these wind turbines are very uh, large machines, uh, and we need to understand yeah how they interact with the the full uh, atmospheric flows. And like in this uh, graph over here, uh, we see the development of onshore and offshore uh, uh, wind energy in the, in the European arena. And then we see that like traditionally wind energy was like mostly produced like onshore, but nowadays like, there's like a big trend also towards like offshore uh, wind energy. So the end of the graph is like 2020. So we see that actually now uh, offshore wind energy is really taking off. Uh, because uh, there's more space there, and uh, one of the trends is that wind energy is moving more offshore. So the, this graph uh, summarizes the, many of the challenges that we face in the in the community. So like it shows the, the large range of length and time scales uh, that are relevant for wind energy uh, applications. So like it ranges from like millimeter scales, which is like the, the flow dynamics uh, around the turbine blade, up to what's like the uh, dynamics around the wind turbine, uh, up to like the major scale processes. Uh, so basically the weather phenomena that uh, affect the flow uh, at a particular site. Uh, and correspondingly, there's like a large range of time scales that correspond to these length scales and then like modeling this large range of length and time scales is like one of the, the very big challenges uh, in the field and like why uh, it's so difficult to study this problem. So it really is like a turbulence problem with like a large range of, of length and time scales. And this also like limits the, the simulations that's, uh, that can be done or the modeling of this. 
And again, this target will mainly focus on like what's happening on the uh, on the wind farm scale. And then towards the end, I will say something on like what this means for like uh, going forward, where we want to couple more of these uh, dynamical skills uh, together. So like the large range uh, of length and time scales also means that you want to have like different modeling. Uh, approaches and like the different modeling approaches are like roughly indicated uh, over here. So yes, analytical modeling approaches, uh, which are computationally very efficient, uh, and they require the, uh, the development of physical insight in order to uh, to develop these methods. Uh, for wind energy, the analytical methods are very relevant because like for wind farm design, it's like crucial to have like also fast ways of calculating roughly the. Uh, production of a wind farm uh, and this is like required if you want to have like an optimal wind farm design you need to do this like very quickly you need to consider like many wind farm layouts so you cannot spend like too much time uh, on like calculating the approximate uh, performance of one wind farm layout but you need to do this very quickly in order to consider like uh, thousands of layouts and this needs to be done for like all wind directions in order to optimize your wind farm layout uh, the most uh, detailed one can do is like a large edge simulation uh, in which you try to resolve as much of the, the flow in the atmospheric boundary layer as possible. So these are like computationally very uh, expensive. Uh, and these are used to develop the physical insights uh, required for the development of the analytical models. Uh, and in between there's like uh, Reynolds average and Stokes equation. So like this is also what is more used uh, in climate modeling type of uh, of studies uh, to get like an intermediate accuracy between like what would be like a, a full analytical model versus like what would be like a full uh, LES model. Uh, in general, uh, there's like a big chance of like what is like the accuracy that you want to obtain with your uh, simulations versus like how much do you uh, want to spend on the simulation in terms of like time and, and computational resources. And depending on the question that you want to ask, uh, you may want to use like one or the other modeling approach. Uh, so the first, uh, let's go into some basic physics of the, of the wind farms. Uh, and then we can see like how we will uh, model this uh, with some uh, simple analytical models. So what we see in the picture over here on the left, uh, is a wind farm uh, in Denmark. Like it's the Hornsraff wind farm, and the red arrow is here indicating the wind direction that's like in this uh, in this wind farm. And then these uh, clouds that are like formed over here are like uh, visualizing the wind turbine wakes. So like the wind turbine wakes are uh, regions of like a lower velocity that are created behind this wind turbine. So the wind turbines are like generating energy. And they are like ener uh, generating this energy by taking the energy out of the wind. So the wind is like slowed down in this wind turbine wake over here. And like here, these clouds become like visible due to the condensation of like air droplets uh, in the air, uh, which is like generated due to the mixing of the, of the atmosphere. And then the uh, air droplets can, uh, can condensate due to the specific atmospheric conditions here. So the uh, this cloud formation actually is like a very rare occurrence. So like this is why there's like a limited number of these pictures. But they're like great to sort of see what's uh, what's happening in the in the wind farm. And then like here on the right, we have the uh, power production of the wind farm. Like many of the graphs today will be a graph like where the power production of the wind farm is uh, normalized by the power production of the first row. So the power production of the first row uh, is like normalizing it uh, such that like this would be like the ideal performance of the wind turbine at that side. And then we see like how all the turbines uh, downstream will sort of do. Uh, and then we see that like the first row is like producing optimally for that side for these wind conditions. And then like all the turbines downstream in this case are like producing 60% of the power production of the first uh, turbine row. Um, so this is like indicating like some important things already. So like you see from this that it is like a very important effect like these wake effects uh, reduce the power production of these turbines by forty uh, percent. So like this is like an important effect to sort of take into consideration. 
Uh, and this happens like even when these storms are like spaced like, quite far apart. So the distance between the storms like nowadays would be typically in the order of, a, uh, of like a kilometer uh, for the newest wind farms. And like what's like very interesting to see is that this power production sort of becomes constant because like you could sort of say like okay the uh, first turbine row is taking energy out of the wind. Uh, then the wind is like slowing down behind the first turbine, so there's like less energy available for the second turbine. So like that second turbine produces like less, which you see in the graph. Uh, by that same logic, you would sort of say that the second turbine is producing uh, power, so like it slows down the wind even more. And then the third turbine should have like even less power available. But like then the graph sort of shows that that does not happen. Because like the third turbine is actually producing the same as the second turbine, so that means that there must be an effect that is uh, compensating for the energy that is like taken out uh, by the second turbine, and this is like one of the crucial effects that we sort of see in uh, the interaction of these large wind turbine arrays uh, with the atmospheric boundary layer. And this is the effect of turbulent mixing in the in the atmosphere. So like if you sort of like indicate this. Uh, schematically, we see the incoming wind here on the left. We see the formation of these wind turbine wakes uh, over here. We see the formation of the wind turbine wakes uh, over here at the cursor. Then we like, have this atmospheric turbulence uh, above the wind farm, and these uh, and this atmospheric turbulence like leads to the uh, replenishment of the energy. Uh, of the wind turbine wake. So the wake is like the lower velocity speed region. The turbulence is like basically the mixing in the atmosphere. And like above the wind farm, there's like a lot of strong wind available. So this turbulence basically transports the energy uh, downwards from the higher atmospheric layers towards like this wind turbine uh, wake region and therefore uh, replenishing this. Basically you get uh, also like a lower velocity or like a lower pressure region over here in this wind turbine wake region. And this sort of like drives this uh, transport of uh, of kinetic energy, and like between the second and the third row, this sort of becomes a like imbalance. So like the second turbine is taking out uh, energy to, to produce energy, and then like this is it starts to be balanced by this uh, turbulent uh, kinetic energy flux that is created. And so like we will first look at like what's like happening in the uh, wind turbine wave region. So the, these are. Uh, actually lab measurements for uh, what's happening behind the turbine. So we see here like the height uh, of the measurements, so the key the turbine as a reference, and then here there's downstream distance. And then like the color here indicates like first the turbulence intensity. So we see that like this turbulence intensity is like uh, very much increased just behind this turbine. So like this is like basically starting this uh, vertical kinetic energy entrainment. Which we can then uh, also like see from measurements is uh, also very much increased if you're like looking just behind the that behind the turbine, and this is then benefiting relatively the turbines that are like sort of downstream. So you of course like create like a velocity deficit behind each turbine, and this velocity deficit is like lower wind speed for turbines downstream. So this is like a negative effect on the power production. But this vertical kinetic energy entrainment is really benefiting relatively the production of downstream turbines, and this is like leading to this balance that was uh, shown in that in that graph. Um, and like we studied this in uh, large eddy simulations, so this is uh, a still image of one of these uh, simulations, and there uh, it's actually a movie, so I'll start the movie also in a bit. Uh, so what we see in this figure here is like the, the wind turbines, uh, which are like uh, located in a grid pattern over here. The blue uh, clouds that you see behind each turbine are like the low velocity wind speed regions. So these are the wind turbine wakes uh, that are created. And these wind turbine wakes in this case are like impinging on these turbines downstream over here. Uh, and this is like then uh, negatively affecting the performance of these downstream turbines. Uh, and you can see that this effect becomes like more difficult for the downstream in the wind farm where we have like all these interacting waves. Uh, and like this is like a very turbulent environment. This is why we do these uh, large eddy simulations. And these white particles are like tracer particles uh, that are like following the flow. So you can sort of see like how turbulent this is. And you can see like all this vertical mixing 
uh, happening in the atmosphere as well. And this vertical mixing here is like indicated by the particles going up and down uh, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and these simulations allow us to sort of study in more detail, like what's like happening in the, in these wind turbine ray boundary layers, and like get a better understanding of like what's uh, the flow of physics that uh, that drives them. So like one important thing is of course to sort of see uh, whether the simulations like reflect reality. So like uh, here we have the field measurements in black, and the the red data points from that simulation are here indicated in. Uh, in the red data points, now we see that they capture both uh, both the same effects. So the crucial physics uh, is present in the simulations. Of course, both the simulations and the the field measurements have like certain assumptions uh, in there. Or the field measurements are complicated by that it is like difficult to measure exactly for that wind direction, and uh, given that it is like a a measurement in an operational wind farm, there's like many complexities in doing these, these field measurements. Uh, simulations are like the modeling of the large eddy uh, type assumptions that are like in there. And we have to have like modeling assumptions for the wind turbine as well. So like the, the wind turbines for these large wind turbine scales are generally wind, uh, actuated disks in many cases uh, in order to simplify the modeling approach uh, for that. Uh, and like this is all validated against uh, field measurements, but still there's obviously uh, modeling assumptions in there. But just like a more uh, detailed picture of uh, the atmospheric physics that we uh, want to explain. So like it's the same as the cartoon picture, but with some more details. So like we're looking at some incoming atmospheric boundary layer flow. So like what will be important is like the thermal stratification in the, in the atmosphere. So like in the presentation here, I will mostly focus on like what it's uh, for neutral condition, but then like also show that like atmospheric conditions do make a difference as it uh, will generate new atmospheric phenomena that will really affect the uh, wind turbine or wind farm performance. We get this formation of this internal boundary layer. So like the, at the leading edge of the wind farm, uh, there's a, the the wakes that are created here are also like forming this internal region where there's like velocity uh, deficits known as this internal boundary layer. So like it's basically the region that's already like affected by the uh, by the wind farm. So this will be important going further downstream. If the wind farm gets like very large, you get like a fully developed uh, wind terminal array boundary layer. For that to happen, the wind farm needs to be like yeah, 10 times longer at least in the atmospheric boundary layer height itself. Like it's happening for like a wind turbine that is like 10 kilometers or longer. And then we get this formation of turbulent kinetic energy. Uh, but like a big challenge is like the interaction of these different wind turbine wakes. Uh, and uh, that is still like an ongoing challenge to, to really do, uh, do the modeling of that correctly. So we have like the wakes, we have this wake interaction that uh, we need to understand better. And like a crucial aspect is disturbing uh, energy entrainments that is shown over here. So basically, you can like divide the, the wind farm in different uh, different regions, and like this is basically giving a summary of the talk that I will also be presenting today. So like we have uh, the developments uh, or entrance region of the wind farm. So like in this region, like the the layout of the wind farm is important. And like this is modeled typically with wake models, uh, which I will discuss in a moment. Then like if you go to like this fully developed region uh, where like there's really like a balance with the atmosphere, then we are looking at uh, top-down models. Uh, and in that region, the uh, the wind farm layout is not so important anymore. Like and it's really just like the uh, the wind turbine density that uh, that affects this overall interaction. Like it turns out that there's also like some things like happening in front of the wind farm. So these are known as induction or like wind farm blockage effects. And then like you're getting more and more of these wind farm clusters. So what's actually happening behind the wind farm and like how this will interact with the next wind farm is actually also like a very important uh, topic of research. Like these are like yeah, wind farm wakes or like yeah, wind farm clusters, uh, like what that uh, map, uh, what happens in these cases. So like wind farm wakes uh, are like analytical expressions of like what the uh, velocity fields in the region behind the wind turbine will look like. And this is like 
uh, simplified analytical expression. So it is a, based on the momentum theory for the uh, Jensen model. So this Jensen model is like a very simple expression for like the velocity in the in the wave. It depends on this uh, a factor, which is like the induction uh, factor of that turbine. So like each turbine has like a certain induction factor. And when you know this induction factor, you can predict the velocity in this wave. And this is like still like a model that is used today. So it's like very uh, simple model, but it is still widely used in wind energy uh, even today. And if you're looking at this uh, this model, so like it's here compared to uh, several other models, and then we see that like the uh, the Jensen model uh, is like a simplistic version of like what the velocity profile would look like. Uh, and there have been developments since. Uh, essentially, it, at the, the group of uh, EPFL, uh, where there's like an improved uh, version of this uh, Jensen model was developed uh, now almost uh, uh, eight years ago, where you see that like it's also in addition capturing the, the Gaussian velocity uh, deficits, and then like it's sort of compared here to the to the experimental values, uh, which the experimental values are like in black, and then the uh, blue line is giving the, uh, the analytical expression for this, so giving good, uh, good agreement between uh, both of them. Um, like when you have these uh, weak deficits, then the, the next question sort of comes in, like how do you model these wind turbine wakes uh, together? And there's like different approaches that are like followed for that. So like it's either like, uh, a linear superposition of the velocity deficits or the or the energy deficits uh, indicated over here, and like it matters like what the incoming flow each, uh, is to each wind turbine. So you can like either take the the, uh, the boundary layer inflow for each turbine, which uh, is used in quite a few models, or you model the inflow to that turbine. So already like taking into account uh, what the velocity at that turbine will be, and like calculate the velocity deficits compared to to that turbine. Uh, so this is like very much like indicating that this is like really an engineering approach that's sort of used in conjunction with these uh, with these weight models. So you have like a weight model expression. You use like one of these uh, engineering approaches to uh, to capture the weight uh, the weight effects uh, or like the uh, the weight interactions in order to calculate the velocity field in the whole flow field like uh, analytically. The benefit of this being that like this analytical model allows you to calculate it directly in your lab that, uh, instantly instead of like using this large edit simulation that needs to be performed on a, on a supercomputer. And so there's, there's developments towards uh, doing this for uh, also like having momentum deficit con uh, conservation in these wake models, but this is still like an ongoing uh, challenge to, to really fully understand this. So the uh, the the wave model is something that you would sort of do if you're like in the entrance region of the wind farm, like if the, the layout of the wind farm is still important and it matters like whether this wind turbine is behind another wind turbine or not. If you're going towards this fully developed regime of the wind farm, you're using something that's like known as like a top-down model approach. And in this case, you're using uh, a horizontal uh, average over the flow. Uh, and then like you take out the momentum uh, that's taken out by the turbines uh, at hub height over here. And this was like first done in uh, really like some earlier models in the 70s, but like a very famous model is the model by Fransen, assuming that there's like a, a log layer for atmospheric flow below the turbines. There's like a log layer above the turbines. And then you match these velocity at hub height by taking out the uh, momentum of these turbines based on the hub height velocity. Um, improvements of this like, uh, include that there's like a, uh, not just two log layers, but there's like the formation of this whole wake layer in the wind farm in between, or like even coupling to the geostrophic flow dynamics, uh, which drive the, the atmospheric flow here in the in the ends, and then you get uh, nonlinear relationships like here uh, to describe the flow in the in the wind farm. Uh, and this behavior is like also tested in uh, the, in large edit simulations. So there's like a simulation from uh, a group of uh, Johns Hopkins showing the 
velocity profile as function of the uh, height here on the horizontal axis, showing that uh, as in like any uh, bounded flow that you get like the formation of logarithmic uh, velocity layers. Here, this region in between the vertical dashed lines are, is the wind turbine region. Uh, uh, and this is like uh, breaking of these two logarithmic velocity profiles, but you get like two of these uh, uh, logarithmic velocity layers. And this allows you to get an expression for the, the roughness height of the wind farm. And this roughness height of the wind farm is giving like a very good proxy of like what would be the velocity at, uh, at hub height over here. The velocity at hub height is what you want to know in order to get some prediction for the uh, power production uh, of the wind farm in terms of the, the wind farm layout and the wind farm layout here being the, uh, the density of the turbines. And so like then the question is like, how well do these uh, analytical models perform? So we sort of compare these models to uh, large edit simulation results. So like these are the large edit simulation results that I showed you earlier. So like it's again, like normalized power production versus the power production on the, on the first row. And then as function of downstream uh, position. So like it's the curve that we discussed where like the first turbine is producing the most, second turbine is producing a lot less due to the wake effect. And then the third turbine is uh, benefiting from the vertical kinetic energy flux, giving a balance between like how much energy each turbine takes out versus how much energy is replenished from above. Uh, if we then compare it to, to these wake model approaches, uh, we see that the wing model approach does give the power production of the second turbine uh, accurately because it knows like the velocity deficit, but it does not necessarily capture the wake wake interactions accurately. Since these are like engineering approaches, depending on the case, uh, the agreement between like LES and wake model can be uh, better or worse, depending on like how well the engineering approach works for that example. Um, and then we have like this top down model approach. Like the top down model approach has like the downside that it is like only capturing the global interaction between the wind farm array and the boundary layer, but it doesn't capture the exact layout uh, effect. So we sort of see that over here that like in principle it captures larger scale interactions accurately, but it does not capture like the local uh, layout. So like it's not necessarily accurate. And it doesn't know like downstream development. So this is here indicated by this horizontal line over here in the figure. So like a way that we developed in order to, to improve on this is like combining both of these uh, weight model approaches and the stop down model approach. So the weight model approach uh, working well in the entrance region of the wind farm, uh, but not working so well in development regions. So here schematically indicated by the uh, winter and wakes that are formed. Uh, and you can calculate like easily the, the wake deficits at each downstream uh, location in the wind farm. And the stop down model approach, which doesn't know information about turbine positioning as it's shown here, but it does capture the interaction with the atmospheric boundary layer. So here is medically indicated by uh, the wind turbine array boundary layer, having an increased roughness height uh, over here. The information of this internal boundary layer, and then you take out this momentum uh, from the turbines here at hub height. And then we combine these two modeling approaches. And this is like indicated here in the blue line, uh, showing that this like gives you like improved predictions by coupling these two approaches. In the entrance region of the wind farm, we uh, benefit from the, the wake model uh, features of the model uh, in the fully developed regime of the wind farm. Uh, you can capture both this, the, the relative position of the turbines as well as the uh, larger scale interactions. Um, and then it just like, allows you to also do this for like all wind farm uh, directions. So like of course the wind farm performance like strongly depends on like, the the wind directions. So like here like it's indicated for the uh, Horns Rev wind farm where this uh, new model is compared to like uh, large eddy simulations uh, and like two of these the models. So like it's just the Jensen model and this uh, this coupled wing boundary layer model, showing that the coupled wing boundary layer model here is giving improved predictions for like various wind directions. And like what you see from here is that like also the wind farm performance is like strongly dependent on the wind direction. So like if the wind direction uh, is more favorable compared to the layout of the wind farm, uh, of course you will have like higher productions than this is where you would need like many uh, evaluations of like the, the wind farm performance for a given site to sort of determine like what's the best wind farm layout at that particular location. 
And then the goal is to incorporate like as many of these uh, atmospheric effects as possible into these models. Because like what is like done here so far is like doing this for like uh, neutral conditions, but the goal is to get like more physics into these models and get a better understanding of this. Uh, with, the op uh, with the ultimate goal to like understand like what's like the uh, your best wind farm layout or what should be your optimal spacing uh, in the wind farm. So you can do like many evaluations of this and this will become like also like site specific depending on like how much cost you uh, have based on like different components in your, in your wind farm design. Some general concepts uh, are like uh, very interesting. So like if you look at the optimal spacing in the wind farm, uh, the question is like where does optimal spacing even come from? Uh, and the optimal spacing is actually a combination of like where like the fluid dynamic effects play a role as well as economical effects uh, play a role. And this we can like see by this very simplistic uh, analysis where we have like the cost of the wind farm uh, analyzed by the cost of the turbines, some cost of cables and cost of land. Uh, and this means that like if you're using more lands, like if you sort of increase the spacing between these turbines, then we will have like more cost, and these costs will in the end like increase quadratically based on like how much uh, land is used. Uh, the revenue of your wind farm will actually uh, increase like, slowly at some point. Like if you look at like the land and increase the spacing between turbines, at some point the revenue, like here, assumed to be like proportional to like how much power production there is, like will be uh, increasing slower. Uh, because like if you sort of increase the distance, like they will sort of benefit, but at some point this benefit will become like less and less uh, once the wake is already like almost fully recovered. And like uh, combining these two curves, like the quadratically increasing cost and the revenue that at some point will uh, asymptote to some uh, uh, final revenue, we will get some uh, some profit and this will give like some optimal uh, spacing between the turbines, which will obviously depend per site, but this is where like, the fundamentally this optimal spacing uh, comes from. Uh, and this you can do like differently for, or you can like get some estimates for like what these uh, spacing should be like an offshore and uh, onshore wind farms based on like yeah, non-dimensional uh, linear costs like uh, mainly driven by electricity cables uh, which especially uh, offshore are very expensive and like how much like land is used uh, and this gives like a somewhat larger optimal spacing in offshore conditions and uh, onshore conditions and this is for like very large uh, ways it also turns out that the optimal spacing will also depend on your wind farm size. Like the larger the wind farm, uh, the larger the, the optimal spacing becomes because they also negatively uh, affect each other. Um, uh, and then dependent, of course, like on many uh, local conditions, but like this gives you uh, a global view of where like optimal uh, spacing is, uh, is coming from. Like as I indicated uh, previously, like what I uh, presented in the first part of the presentation is that like a lot of the uh, things have been developed for like neutral atmospheric boundary layers and like the smaller wind turbines that are sort of used. Uh, and like we saw in like, the very beginning of the presentation that all the, the wind turbines are getting bigger uh, and like larger. And this leads to like new physics that needs to be explored. So like here, this is a given uh, in this uh, in this sketch, like where like there's like cities uh, and like the smaller turbines, here like on a logarithmic scale, so like this like, sort of uh, uh, emphasizes like, the the different physical ranges that are like uh, over there. Uh, and like what's like important to realize is that these uh, wind turbines are getting so large that they're basically not getting into this uh, inertial uh, sub layers anymore, where like normally. Uh, a lot of the measurements are there, so like it's like easier to sort of do like measurements in this lower atmosphere. But these wind turbines are here at this intermediate uh, range of scales, uh, where you have like, this outer layer formation or like this logarithmic uh, region of velocity profile. Uh, whereas like even like higher uh, elevations are even also like better known and characterized like, where there's like more uh, flights and like weather predictions sort of like important here, but like there's like sort of like a terra incognita 
for like the atmospheric uh, dynamics that need to be uh, further explored. But there's also like a lot of like interesting uh, atmospheric phenomena that are like happening in this uh, still like relatively unexplored area. And like one of these things is like uh, low level jets that are like formed in uh, stable atmospheric boundary layers. So like these low level jets are like basically occurring around uh, the world and like are formed in uh, stable atmospheric boundary layers. Uh, and like these low level heights, so these are measurements from the Kabao Tower in uh, the Netherlands. So these low level heights can be formed at like already like 80 to 140 meters and like also get higher elevations. But yeah, these modern wind turbines are already like in this range over here where like these low level jets occur like quite frequently uh, uh, with like an occurrence uh, up to like 30%, uh, especially in night in nighttime conditions, so, like, these low level jets are like formed at night. And like stable atmospheric conditions are like mostly formed at that uh, point. So, like this still forms like a large part of the, the power production and like can like really affect uh, wind turbine performance. So like in order to get like a better understanding of like how these wind uh, farms and like wind turbines are like affected, affected by these low level jets, uh, we formed like several simulations in which we like, changed the uh, atmospheric stability, so like making like different uh, stable boundary layers. And like in this particular case, like we changed like the, the height of the turbine in order to study what's like the height of the turbine versus like the low level jet height, like how does this affect uh, the performance of the wind farm. Um, so like we would have like a different atmosphere where like there's like a, a turbulent flux that is also like affected by this uh, by this temperature. So like uh, atmosphere is like stably stratified. Uh, and then we can have like the low level jet like above the wind turbine. So like if the low level jet is like above the wind turbine, we will actually find that we get like a similar uh, physics and phenomena as that we observed previously. So like the low level jet above the wind turbine means that like most of the energy is above the wind farm. You would still get this more or less like lower pressure region that is like created behind uh, each wind turbine, which then like drives this extraction of energy from above the wind turbine away towards the, the hub height plane. Uh, and there then like replenishes energy, like it actually can increase like power production of the wind farms by the, the higher amount of energy that is available from this, from this jet. Um, if the jets are like coming directly at the, the height of the turbines, uh, then we see that like basically the, the first one is like really benefiting from this, but like all the ones that are like behind uh, cannot really benefit from this. The, the very interesting cases like form whenever these turbines are getting so high that these low level jets will actually go below the turbines. And in this case, you would actually expect that power production of these turbines would be uh, very much impacted because like, well, like, uh, energy is coming from above. If the low level jet, all the energy is below, then you would sort of think like, okay, like, well, this would not uh, produce like, too much energy, but like, it actually turns out that there's still like an energy flux that is created, but like now from below to above. Uh, and this is like due to the combination of like this the turbulence that is like generated in the wakes uh, with this like negative shear of, of the jet that is then transporting energy upwards. So, So like here we have like some visualizations of these different cases. So like you see that like actually the, the physics is like pronounced different if you really look at the atmosphere. So here these low level jet is like uh, somewhat above the turbine. So we see that like it's like a very turbulent atmosphere indicated here by this uh, vortex visualization showing that like the wind turbine wake very quickly breaks down. If the low level jet is at the same height as the turbine, like you already see, like the turbulence is like less uh, overall over the wind turbine. Like actually, this wind turbine wake uh, is more persistent and like uh, develops uh, slower. So it actually takes like longer for this uh, energy to be entrained. Uh, and there's like even more so the case uh, when the low level jet is below uh, the turbine. So here you actually see like very clear formation of like uh, four like structures behind the winter ramp and they persist for like a uh, quite a long time. 
so based on this view, you would expect, okay, like the terminals down here would do, would have like a hard job producing any power because like, they're just fully in the wake and the wake is not really merging. Um, but like this happens like differently if you look at the, the wind farm. So like this is like uh, on the left, we have an like instantaneous velocity uh, at the hub height for these different cases. So like top one is like jet above the, the hub high plane, uh, lower panels like jet uh, below the hub high plane, and the, the right panels here indicate the turbulence intensity. So like important here to see is like for the first uh, turbine row, we see that there's indeed this very strong wake that is created. So like the very strong wake is like a very low turbulence intensity here in the entrance region of the wind farm much lower than it would be in these other atmospheric conditions indicated over here. So here we have already like a higher turbulence intensity in the entrance region of the wind farm. But then like the, the wind farm also creates its own uh, turbulence intensity. So the uh, wind turbine waves also generate like a lot of mixing. And you can see that over here in the remainder of the figure is that like, even though like if the, the turbine is like operating uh, in this like low atmospheric turbulence region, if you do this in, like in a wind farm setting, they'd still create like uh, an amount of turbulence that is like of the same order of magnitude as what would be generated uh, if the wind farm itself was already like in a in a very atmospheric uh, environment. And like it's like not in this case, like it's not the, the atmospheric turbulence that is like generating this vertical kinetic energy flux, but it's really just like the turbulence of like all these wind turbine wakes that is like generating that uh, that energy flux. And then like as indicated in that sketch, like it's uh, it's in this case like really like unexpectedly like helping the, the power production of uh, of turbines uh, by like transporting the energy from like the, the jet that's like below the turbines, uh, pushing that, that energy upwards. And like here you see this, uh, this benefits uh, setting in like somewhat further downstream in the wind farm. So like it's the, the normalized power production versus the uh, downstream distance in the, the wind farm. Uh, and like what is compared here is the, the, the three different cases. So like the blue one is basically similar to the case that we have really presented in the first part of the, the presentation. Uh, the black one is like the, uh, the jet coming in at the turbine hub height. And then the, the red one is like the uh, jets under the, the wind farm. And then you see that like at the end of the wind farm, so like you're like roughly at like uh, row number five and further downstream, you really see the, the benefit of this jet setting in. Uh, and like you have like this very pronounced benefit also like it's entrance region of the wind farm. So here you see like the naive expectation here would be the entrance. Uh, there's like no turbulent mixing of these wakes, so like it really goes down quickly. But then, like already at the third row, you see that like it recovers to uh, to the more or less like base case where like the, it's like the wake assistant turbulence that really uh, sets this whole process into motion. Um, and you can do like a more detailed analysis of this. So this is like where we take like a control volume analysis of like all the different energy fluxes in the in the wind farm. Uh, and then like, what's like especially important is like the vertical kinetic energy flux. Like we also analyze all these different uh, terms over here. But like many of these wind farm cases, like this vertical kinetic energy flux uh, is important, which is like the one that we're plotting here for these uh, different cases. And so there's like the, the integrated flux, like which is like uh, high for like the jet above the, the, the farm. Uh, it's like in between for the jet below the farm and it's very low. Uh, when the jet is at the hub heights, because like in that case, like just uh, the first row really benefits uh, from the wind farm. Uh, but the pronounced difference here is indicated in this graph, like where this energy is coming from. So if you do this control volume, so the energy can either come from above or it can come from below. So the, the general case, like if the jets or most of the atmospheric flow is thrown above, the entrainment is happening from the top plane. So that's the first. Uh, far where like okay the energy is sort of coming from above like if most of the energy is actually below so if you have like a strong jet below the wind farm you will actually see that this entrainment is like happening from below so like, the, the, the red line over here indicating most of this entrainment is happening from below whereas like the first uh, conceptual picture is like everything is coming from above but this does not always have to happen so like this uh, in more special atmospheric conditions 
uh, this entrainment can also like happen from below specifically when you get like this low level jet formation in uh, uh, in stable boundary layers. And there's still like a variety of like atmospheric conditions that like need to be like further explained. Like what does this really mean? Like not just for like the power production of like wind farms, uh, but like also what would this mean for like the loading of these of these wind turbines? Like what are like the forces that are like on these wind uh, turbines? Uh, because these also like turn out to be like highly affected by uh, by such atmospheric phenomena. So like these these low level jets can also like have like a large influence on like yeah what would be the forces on these wind turbine blades and like lead to like asymmetric forces on these uh, wind turbines uh, and like hence uh, change like the, the fatigue loadings on these turbines which is like uh, very much related to like the yeah, the turbine characteristics of the atmosphere and like this still needs uh, further understanding as well. Um, so like we've seen so far in the whole presentation that we always are comparing as well like what's like the uh, performance of like all the turbines uh, downstream in the wind farm compared to what is like the performance of their, their first turbine in the row. Uh, uh, this is like always under the assumption that like somehow the first turbine would like get ideal uh, atmospheric conditions and like it's always producing like optimally uh, but this neg neglects like a new phenomenon that people have become like aware of which is like wind farm uh, blockage and there's like the induction region that's like created in front of the uh, the wind farm so like in principle like blockage is like a, a known uh, a known thing so like it's basically uh, the incoming air uh, to your wind uh, turbine uh, feels that there's like an obstruction and then due to the uh, pressure field like the flow will sort of like flow around your your turbine so it will sort of like be uh, be deflected so that also like in front of like a, a wind turbine you would sort of get this so you would sort of get uh, an analytical expression also from uh, actuated disk or vortex theory which is like giving the normalized velocity in front of your uh, turbine uh, and then like upstream, you see that like the velocity is already decreasing uh, somewhat. Um, but like for like a single turbine, like this is like, sort of like well known. Uh, but like for like a wind farm, uh, this is like a bigger deal because like for like the single turbine, if you like test out the single turbine, you would sort of like know already like how well is a single turbine uh, producing because like you, this single turbine would be sort of validated uh, with measurements so like the effect of this flow induction of like this uh, flow shutting down in front of the single turbine is already like incorporated in like all the measurement curves that you would sort of get from like some turbine manufacturer so like, if you're like a wind farm developer you would simply know like how well is this turbine uh, performing and this like induction in front of the single turbine is already like accounted for completely because it gets like in all the, the validation curves that's already like accounted for. Uh, however, this is not the case if you're like a, a wind farm uh, developer and you're doing this for like a bigger wind farm, because again, like the flow induction of like turbines that are close to each other will like actually affect the performance of like neighboring turbines. And like the big uh, point in that is that like in many cases, like the, the first turbine is like known as a reference. So like if the first turbine, which is like the reference turbine is like producing differently than like what you would expect, uh, then like the whole uh, wind farm performance is not fully understood. Um, uh, because like what actually turns out to be the case like the first turbine row is like in general, for like most wind farm configurations, like it tends to be like a little bit lower than you would maybe expect uh, based on like the freestanding performance. So like, you know, to really understand these blockage effects, we have to look at like three different con uh, configurations, so like either like the freestanding turbine for which like the turbine is like validated. We can sort of uh, test out like what does like an infinite row do, so like what does like these standardized interactions between these turbines. And we can uh, really have this a wind farm uh, layout configuration, like what does like the effect of both uh, standardized turbines like next to it and streamwise turbines. So what is given over here uh, is like the performance of like a freestanding turbine and an infinite row compared to so the it's the infinite row one turbine in the infinite row over one tur one freestanding turbine so like higher means like larger than uh, than expected for the freestanding turbine so this would be a beneficial effect 
like it's a comparison of uh, several uh, wind tunnel experiments as well as like several simulations that are formed. And then like a function of the spin by spacing between the, the turbines. Like it actually turns out that like if you place them like close together in spin wise direction, uh, you can actually have like some benefit. So again, this benefit can even be fairly large. But it should be appreciated this is like only happening for very small spin wise spacings. And like for like very large uh, wind farm arrays, like the spacing tends to be like larger. So like what we sort of see for like the optimal spacing uh, for the wind farms, it tends to be like more in the uh, seven to 10 uh, turbine distance uh, ratios. So it gets like more in the region where like the spin wise buckets is not uh, really observed anymore. Uh, so the spin wise buckets is coming from like the flow approaching the flow, like the flow sort of like bended around uh, each turbine. And then it like, sort of like, yeah, forcing the flow into like neighboring turbines. Uh, and then like the, the, yeah, the block, the flow blockage is like in that sense, like increasing an acceleration in that plane. Uh, increasing the, the power production of the of the neighboring turbine by like really forcing the flow into like uh, the, yeah the the rotor the rotor swept area of like neighboring turbines, but again like for real wind farms they are more like in the seven to ten uh, turbine distance ratios so, like where this effect is like not so visible. And so what you can also like do is compare like the performance of a turbine in the first row of a wind farm compared to the freestanding turbine. And then we do this for like different combinations of streamwise and spanwise spacing. So like S is actually here, the square root of like streamwise and spanwise spacing. And then you get like a more mixed uh, view. It's like it's sort of like indicating uh, it's not just the turbine density that is like important, uh, but like it's really the combination of streamwise and spanwise spacing that's, that matters. So like just a streamwise patient, you can sort of like test by uh, doing the, the row performance first, like the first row of the wind farm. And this like normalizes out then the, the spanwise blockage effects uh, that we have seen in the beginning. And then we see that like the, the downstream turbines here affect the, the flow performance or the performance of the first row in a negative way. Like the first row performance here is like slightly negative compared to the slightly lower compared to what it would be for like an infinite row. And this becomes like stronger when the distance is like larger. Uh, for like typical cases, if it is like a neutral atmosphere, like the, the effect is like a, a few percentage points. A few percentage points for like a whole wind farm since like it's like a normalization of all your curves. You can still be millions of dollars uh, if you're like off by a few percentage points in like production. And if you under or over estimate that that production, this still could like equivalent to like millions of dollars. So this is why like it's very much like of interest to to industry. Uh, and the curve here is like a line of like uh, measurements uh, in a wind tunnel, and then for like a uh, laminar flow conditions, where else like the simulations are like done for like atmospheric turbulence conditions. Showing that like the, the turbulence intensity by itself does not affect this uh, this effect too much, and the streamwise blockage effects is basically originated from the, the flow that is like affected over the wind farm. So this is what we sort of see over here in this graph is where we like plot the uh, the vertical velocity and this vertical velocity is like sort of showing that the flow is like deflected over the wind farm, and then it basically is like driving away like some of the winds from the first row of the wind farm because this flow deflection gets like very strong. Uh, basically some of the, the wind that is like originally at hot by is already deflected over the wind farm and therefore reducing the, the amount of incoming winds to the to the first turbine rows. Uh, and like hence uh, uh, negatively yeah, impacting that that performance over there. And this effect becomes like more uh, more important in like thermally stratified boundary layers. Like if we increase like uh, stability, so we do it for like different distances between the turbines. Like you see that like the flow blockage here is actually increasing when we increase the uh, thermal stability in the boundary layer. Uh, and this is created because like the cold air that is move, moving upwards creates like a cold anomaly like higher up and this creates like a higher pressure force uh, in the stable boundary layer compared to like a neutral boundary layer. And this 
uh, additional pressure anomaly that is like created due to like the cold air that is like moving up. So like you basically move like more fluid mass upwards, uh, increase like this, this pressure gradient and this pressure gradient is like here, increase for like the stable case in red versus like the, the neutral case. And this increased uh, pressure anomaly like is uh, enhancing the wind farm blockage effect, which originates from these uh, pressure gradients that sort of like slow down the wind uh, in front of your wind farm. Like different stability conditions or like atmospheric conditions really even affect this flow blockage phenomena, which uh, can therefore also be different uh, on each side that you're considering. And so to finalize, I wanted to say something on what it actually means if you have like more of these wind farm clusters together. So if you have like the wind farm wake or like the whole wind farm wake over here, and then like the wind farm wake will sort of uh, exit from your wind farm. And this will like affect like neighboring wind farm uh, wind farms. Uh, and this becomes like more important for like the North Sea, for example, where like in Northwestern Europe, like you see like many of these wind farms are like actually placed like relatively close together. Uh, close together, meaning that these wake effects can be observed like 10 to 50 or like so, some extreme case like 100 kilometers behind your wind farm uh so that these wind turbine wakes actually turn out to be like very persistent and this is where like uh close is like a relative term in this sense that these wind farm wakes can actually develop for like quite a distance so we can test this specifically for like offshore conditions because of what's uh, that like most of these wind farms like nowadays being built and then like change like the distance between these uh, farms and consider this for uh, different layouts. And like here we change the distance between like five and 15 kilometers. So like here we will have like an upstream farm and a downstream farm. And the, the goal is to sort of understand what's the upstream farm doing to the downstream farm. And like it's like done in like a full large edit simulation where like all these interactions are like included. So this is making it like very large uh, simulations. So like we will look at these uh, two different farms, like the upstream farm, which we essentially already discussed. And then like, what does this do on the downstream farm? And you can look at like, well, what does it do to the velocities in your farm? So like the horizontal velocities uh, around the first and second farm. So you see that there's actually this larger scale structure that's already created that you can sort of visually see here. If you have like two wind farms close, close together, when the uh, farms are like uh, further apart, like they actually look like pretty similar. So if you look at what's like happening in this downstream farm and the upstream farm, like it actually looks fairly similar at this distance. But like fairly similar is not actually exactly similar. So that's 15 kilometers. It sort of seems like, okay, like this would be similar. If you look at power production, it actually is not. So like if you normalize with the power production of the first row uh, of your first farm, you will actually see that like the entrance region of the, the wind farm is like always producing quite a bit less. But like even at 15 kilometers, even though like it looks similar in the velocity field, like it's actually still like affected by uh, more than 10% at like a, a 15 kilometer distance. But like the, uh, the nice thing to sort of see is that like further downstream in the wind farm, like it actually does really recover. Like the these uh, fields are like uh, sort of showing similar to these entrance of the wind farm is like affected by uh, the wind farm wake of the upstream farm. Further downstream in the wind farm, like the wind farm is creating, it's more or less like its own microclimates uh, and therefore creating a similar performance like whether the upstream farm is there or not. Um, uh, or you can like normalize with the first row uh, of each wind farm. And then you can actually see that like in this case, like the first row uh, of each wind farm individually is not necessarily the best reference because then you sort of get the impression that these downstream wind farms are like doing much better, whereas like that is actually not the case. Like this is actually showing that normalizing with the power uh, with the turbine uh, first turbine of its of its own farm is actually giving like in this case like a misleading example, but you really need to see like the larger system uh, in order to get a good impression of that. You actually see like the, the better like that there's like these much larger scale interactions if you look at the uh, this vertical kinetic energy flux so you sort of see here the flux of the first farm that's created and then like uh, the second wind farm that's created over here what you see like here like very clearly is that like the uh, especially also like at higher elevations like the wind farms like really affect the large scale flow structures uh, in the atmosphere and therefore like also like 
uh, affect the, the larger scale interaction uh, of this wind farm with the with the boundary layer. The power production is like mostly visible here at the entrance region, but like actually these wind farms are like affecting like the flows on like a much much larger scale. And like one of the things like where you can for example see that is like if you look at the velocity recovery behind uh, even the second farm and compared to the uh, to the first farm and then you'll actually see that if you compare like the velocity recovery behind the first and the second farm because upstream farm is the first downstream is the second turbine uh, farm you will actually see that the uh, recovery behind these downstream wind farms is actually faster like these lines go up like a little bit faster uh, than like for the upstream farm it doesn't really show just like large scale interactions so like just like looking at the power production giving similar curves doesn't necessarily say that nothing is happening there's really these larger scale interactions that like needs uh, better understanding. So this is basically giving like the summary side of what we discussed like the different wind farm uh, regimes like for the induction in front of the wind farm, like the really the flow dynamics in the wind farm up to what is like a fully developed uh, wind farm array. And then like how this also like affects like wind farm uh, clusters in the end. Uh, so like, this would be uh, given time a, a good way to also uh, end the presentation. So there's like various ways to sort of uh, increase like wind farm uh, production. Uh, but given time, I will uh, uh, skip over this. Uh, but there's like ways to sort of do like wind farm control or like different wind farm uh, layouts in order to increase the production given uh, given the turbine size. Um, because like the what you can like sort of like learn from this is that uh, the the wind farm as a whole is uh, working in a different way than uh, the individual turbines are are performing. So each turbine by itself is like uh, performing in a greedy way, trying to like maximize its own power production. But like what has been shown by the community is that if you sacrifice the performance of like some of the turbines, or in particular the first turbine row, like it's actually possible to have the collective wind farm uh, performance like benefit from this. Uh, so it just like ways to sort of increase your uh, your wind farm performance by like adjusting essentially the controls or like in this case like the uh, the yaw alignment of the turbines to sort of like deflect the, the weights in the wind farm. Or you can play around with uh, the the layout of the wind farm in more advanced ways by uh, using like vertical staggering. So this would sort of like allow you to affects uh, the number of like atmospheric layers from which you can like generate uh, energy. So like not just at one layer, but like at different layers. Uh, and then like the question is like, well, like does this benefit from uh, this vertical kinetic energy flux? What you could then like actually would find is that like it's essentially the entrance region can like benefit like a lot. Uh, similarly, we sort of find that like the performance in the uh, fully developed regime of the wind farm would be more or less constant uh with this like you would actually still create like enough mixing in order to uh, get like the same performance downstream but like only upstream you would sort of really benefit from this like in the downstream region uh, you would actually see that the, the larger turbines are like essentially stealing too much energy from the, the smaller turbines and then the benefit of like applying vertical staggering will actually uh, diminish what seems to be like a very promising way, a way to increase performance is like using uh, wind breaks or uh, uh, like wind concentrates. So this uh, work together with uh, Louis and Liu. I saw that he was also in the in the audience today. And like in this case, like you build some like wall in front of your turbine. Uh, this will actually generate some local flow speed up here, just like behind your. Uh, this rotary would actually see like the wind velocity is like highest, more or less like in this location, and this like actually allows you to uh, to benefit from this. Like, actually, a concept that is also tested uh, by companies, which like allows you to like have like this local speed up into the the turbine, um, which is like uh, validated against the field measurement data here. Uh, uh, and then like this create this like this local speed up of, of the flow into these uh, turbine planes and this uh, this is like benefiting these turbines. 
and then we tested it out for like multiple uh, wind uh, farm configurations, changing the wind rate heights and the, the spacing between all these turbines. And now what you would find is that like the especially the first row can actually benefit if they a lot from these wind concentrators or like wind breaks, so like you would actually get like a large increase uh, in performance and like further downstream this benefit is like less. And this is because like there's a uh, uh, compromise in like how many of these wind breaks you're like sort of putting. So the wind break is giving like the local speed of the flow uh, and like you place like the wind turbine in that local uh, flow speed of region. But then like, it also like, adds like an additional drag to the whole atmospheric bound layer, which is like showing the flow as a whole down. So you get like the whole, uh, yeah, the, the local speed of which is beneficial with you compared to like the local drag that's sort of like, added. Uh, and this will, in the end, like get some balance. But like what we sort of show here is that it is like possible to actually get like an overall benefit for, for this. But the wind rates need to be different for like a wind farm than what they need to be for like a, a, a single turbine. Like for like a single turbine, like the wind rate needs to be like fairly high and close to the turbine. In the wind farm, the distance is like a little bit larger and like the wind break shouldn't be too high. So not to make this uh, drag effect like too, uh, too large. Uh, and this would sort of see if you compare like the, uh, the power point of your wind farm versus like the number of wind rates that you're like, uh, placing you to sort of see that like, the first wind break is by far the most beneficial like placing all the other ones uh, has like, a smaller benefit for the whole wind farm performance like the, the goal would also be to sort of get a better understanding of what would be the, the best combination of like wind breaks and wind farms that you can, uh, can sort of do and so like uh, where this will go like longer term is like that's that we sort of see that yeah, there's like interactions or like multiple skills that are like sort of like happening so like what's uh, what this will mean for the community is that like more different skills will need to be sort of coupled. So like what we now look at uh, primarily is like really what's like happening at wind farm scale, uh, and like really looking at like what's like the induction rate of the wind farm, uh, the wind farm dynamics itself, and like what it sort of like would mean for like the interaction between like wind farms. But this will give like larger challenges on like what would this mean to sort of couple different skills, like looking at both coupling wind farm uh, dynamics to smaller scale dynamics or like coupling the wind farm dynamics to like even larger scale dynamics to understand like what's like really larger scale interactions that we uh, can expect over here. Uh, and like with, uh, with this upcoming challenge of like yeah, the development of more like multi-scale models that can really capture like physics of all these different length scales uh, simultaneously, like I would like to uh, Thank you for your attention, and I would be uh, happy to take uh, any questions at this point. Great. So thank you very much, Richard. That was a, an excellent talk. Um, covered a lot. Uh, we do have time for questions, so I can open it up uh, to the audience. Uh, if you're in the audience, feel free to just unmute and ask, or put your hand up, or even just add to the chat. So we already have uh, one person with their hand up. Uh, Tusha, please go ahead. Yep. Hello, Richard. This is uh, Tushai from University of Melbourne. And thank you so much for such an insightful talk. I just had a small question in the initial slides where you presented some experimental measurements showing stresses terms for flow across a turbine. Those contours you showed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my question was, were those measurements only for a single turbine? And uh, also, if it was like based on PIV or uh, probe measurements, yeah, this like. Um, so I, I did not do the, these measurements myself. Uh, okay. So like, I'm not sure like on all the details. Like, I think they 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 have done this also like for like multiple multiple arrays. Like they would sort of, like, do like several of these model wind turbines behind each other. They would, they would have done this for like smaller wind farms. Like okay. I think it's pretty much PIV that is uh, that is used uh, for these sort of pictures. Uh, okay. But like they also have to do like local measurements. Like all all sort of measurements are are like done on this. Like in wind, in wind tunnels, they they would use like yeah, the most advanced techniques available. So like either like local or like more global picture of the velocity. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Cool. Thank you for the question. Um, Anyone else uh, in the audience have any questions? 
while people are, are gathering their thoughts, I might have a quick question, which I think he sort of actually started answering a little bit. But my question was thinking about at the start, you mentioned the onshore versus offshore um, wind farms. And I was wondering, is there much change in the fluid dynamics if they're onshore versus offshore? And I think you gave one example where you changed the, the surface roughness. Was that one of the... Yeah, so the, the, there could be changes in the dynamics or like many different aspects of that, so to say. Mm -hmm. So uh, like uh, on a very global scale, like the, the difference between like onshore and offshore is that like uh, onshore tends to, tends to be larger than like offshore. So the, the weight development uh, or like the weight recovery in an, uh, an offshore environment tends to be like somewhat slower than in an, an offshore or like than in an on, onshore environment. So like, Offshore, like lower turbulence intensity, so like the weights persist like longer. So like, offshore, you would basically put like the wind turbines uh, somewhat further apart because like, these weights would like persist longer. So you would want to place like the wind turbines like, a little bit further apart. Offshore, you would also have like space like, that is like more somewhat more easily accommodated. Uh, but there's like still like many open questions. So like it can become like very difficult where like. Uh, in an offshore environment, you can have like interaction with like the, the ocean surface, so like then like different uh, atmospheric states and like ocean conditions can like interact and like give uh, give new dynamics. Especially if you look at like uh, offshore turbines, like the, the floating devices that you're like now uh, considering, like if you have like a floating platform, then there can be like many interactions with like the, the wave states and like the atmospheric dynamics. Uh, and like in complex terrain, of course, the things can become like also, uh, and that's like more difficult to understand because like now like it's like all like a flat surface, but on shore you would also like quite often have like complex terrain because like there's like hills and like other buildings or like structures uh, close by, like then like they would also like, really affect the dynamics, so to say. And so uh there's still many things to also like better understand there so to say like the different challenges uh, onshore and offshore oh, it sounds like yeah they're both kind of complicated system at least on on land everything's a bit more stationary but uh <laughs> yes well, I the, uh, yeah so like the, the complex environment is still or like, yeah, like hills but like also like <laughs> given that like the interactions are like happening on such large scales because like the same as like a, a wind farm uh the, the wind farm rates are persisting over like tens of kilometers mm -hmm. uh, when you build these like larger scale wind farm systems like they would actually affect like really flow on like larger scales like this is where like even interactions with cities and so on like could could affect that so to say yeah i think yeah that all makes sense thank you uh, we have a, another question from the audience. Uh, so, Lin Yang, feel free to ask. Hi, Richard. Uh, Lisa Lin Yang comes from Goldwind, Australia. So, uh, I have a question about the, 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 this LES, the large AD simulation. So, in Australia, most of the project wind farms are in East Coast, and the terrain is quite complicated, which means the ambient turbulence is very complex. So I'm thinking like uh, this large AD simulation compared with traditional renal average simulation, like how like the results looks like if applying in a complex terrain and uh, complex layout. Um, so like you can do in principle like LES of like every size. Uh, it's like if you give like uh, if you have like the whole terrain side sort of can like you in principle can like incorporate that like in a large edge simulation and like it can like uh, a large edge simulation would also like deal well with like the flow separation and so on like behind that complex terrain like where like it gets like difficult to analyze is that it becomes like very site specific so like I guess what is still like a big challenge is like like how to really understand this uh, because if you can do the simulation but like each side would be different. So like to somehow like generalize the knowledge as in like, okay, like you can do like a simulation of like that side, but then to somehow generalize uh, to like a simpler model to sort of quickly assess it, like that's still like a big challenge. So this is still uh, insight on that is like limited. So you can do like a simulation, but then they can become like a site specific simulation. And then like if you would have like a different site, it would be different again. So like for these wind farm design tools, like that's like a big challenge, I would say, because again, like if you don't really know like what the full physics is, predicting the next site is very difficult. And then like doing like a very big simulation for each site 
uh, is still like impossible. It's just too, too time consuming to do that. Uh, so like there's still big challenges there, so to say. And then like if you couple this with different atmospheric conditions, like it gets even worse, so to say, to, to fully understand that. Yeah. Okay, thanks for, for the answer. Okay, any more questions coming from the audience at this time? All right, so, so if not, I think we might uh, thank our speaker once again, and uh, I think we'll finish our first seminar of, of this year. So thanks again, Richard. Okay, thank you so much for having me. And I think we can stop.